Hi everybody, I'm Wendy Murdoch and this is Webinars with Wendy. I've been doing a series of webinars during the pandemic to entertain myself, learn something and talk to uh, really, really fascinating people. Tammy and I have not actually met in person, but this is our second webinar. And we had such a great conversation the other day. I was like, you have to come back and talk to everybody on another <laughs> webinar. So I drug her back <laughs> and here she is. And thank you, Tammy, so much for joining us again. Well, thank you for having me. It's always exciting to come on and chit chat and share information. Yep. So there's probably a bunch of people watching this webinar that may not have watched your first one or don't know your background. So can you just give us a brief background of how you got to where you are today and, and what it is that you do? Okay, so um, I actually have a degree in fine art painting. So very far removed from what I'm doing today. Um, and what I do now is I do physical therapy or structural therapy for horses. And um, over the last, I think, four or five years, I've married my art and my obsession for anatomy with helping horses. And um, that's how we got here. <laughs> yeah. And if anybody has not seen Tammy's drawings, you can go to, you can see them on Facebook because she posts quite frequently, yeah. but you also have a website where they can see your work. Yeah. So I recently um, started to play with just animating it so that there would be a linear process to the explanation and a visual accompaniment to seeing that. And that's on uh, Vimeo, the art of seeing the horse. So you can go and check that out. You can check it out through the Facebook as well. It's also on there. Awesome. Yeah, because um, I just remember from last time, your your drawings are so compelling. They're they're colorful and they're bright and they're really fun, but they're really, really informative. And I think that, um, that instead of the old kind of stodgy kind of drawings, these are just so vibrant and really fun that it- Well, it, it's how I learned, right? So when I was trying to put in my brain all that anatomy and all those connections and the horse, one of the ways of doing that, and you know, we know from research that when you have hand-eye coordination and color coding and things like that, learning becomes a more successful process. And so that's really how that came about. <laughs> That's awesome. So I, I think the message here too is that if anybody wants to learn more about anatomy and horses, get the coloring books, get out some color pens, start to draw. And there's so much to be said for that kinesthetic, that moving while you're learning. Um, I've actually taught um, the field model for anatomy and clay. And I've done the course several times teaching it. And when you build the muscles out of clay and put them on the model, um, it's you learn it at a deeper level. So any kind of physical activity along with learning instead of just rote learning, just sitting there trying to yeah. memorize is really, really powerful. And I think that, that um, your work so brings that to the fore. It's really- Thank awesome. you. Yeah. All right, so what are we gonna talk about today? So today we're gonna talk about, um, COVID's been a great year for me in the sense that it's allowed me time to think outside the box. And I've had to communicate with a whole bunch of my clients long distance, which has brought on this whole distance structural therapy concept. And um, in order to help them, I've had to be able to get them to see what I see. And um, really, this is about structural assessment made easy, made simple, so that it's not intimidating. Anybody can see it. You don't have to pick up anything or move anything on the horse. It's just information that's there for you to collect. And I've kind of streamlined it a bit. And I'm all about owner empowerment because um, that's the best way to reach as many horses as possible. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Awesome. All right, well, let's go. All right, let me um, let me do this. Bear with me while I do all my things broadcast. And if anybody has any questions during the webinar, please put it in the chat or the Q&A. Um, and then I'll just ask in the appropriate moments. Um, okay, can we see that? Because I can't see anybody. So I'm just going to yeah, assume you're along it. with me. <laughs> um, and you can, I don't know why you disappear. Wait. Um, yeah, I don't know. I can only see this. Yeah. Um, you should be in my little screen on the right, but that block is now black. So I, I don't know why. Okay. I haven't done anything other than share my screen. <laughs> That's fine. So what I might do, Tammy, during the talk is that if there's times when you're talking, we want to see you just unshare your screen and then we can go back. Fair enough. Let's do that. Okay. okay. So let's start. The art of seeing the horse, structural assessment made simple. And this really is about 
empowering everybody to be able to see. Um, so in order to help improve function, we need to learn to see the form, right? That's the concept. We need to learn to think of the horse as a three-dimensional structure that we can observe. So when we look at general um, equine physical evaluation, there are very often very complex forms that, you know, all these specialists come out with. I used to be the same. I had a form, you fill it all in, there's lots of windows. And then these people look for responses, right? So uh, pain, range of motion. Well, over the year, I've read a couple of books that I've listed in the back that have really made it clear that pain is a very relative thing. And it's very, very hard to measure. And it's really down to the individual and how they are as a living creature. Uh, range of motion, again, it's open to interpretation. So all these things are relative. And I started to question what they were giving us. So it's not that it's not valid, but it's, it's a response to something that, um, yes, we know that hurts, but in the grand scheme of things, that is the result. Uh, lack of range of motion somewhere is the result. It is not the cause. And so I started to think in a more global way of looking at it. And then, you know, the other thing was when I was communicating with these clients online is it was really hard to kind of gauge success in terms of did we achieve a change? And so that again changed the way that we look because if I restore range of motion in a joint and I tell the client, yes, this is now working. Well, maybe they can see it, maybe they can feel it and maybe they can't. But if the horse was crooked and now it's straight, they can see that. And additionally, there was the terms that we use in order to, um, communicate what we find. A lot of these uh, medical veterinary terms are hard for the average horse owner because we have to translate it in our brain. A lot of people may know it, but I still have to do it. When somebody says to me, oh, the pelvis has an anterior rotation. Well, I have to go, wait, anterior pelvis rotation. You have to break it up and it's not user-friendly. And we live in a world where things have become more user-friendly. So I guess that's what I was trying to do. So the concept here is the beauty of simplicity. And I'm sure most of you have seen, let's see if it, there you go. Picasso drawing his bull in a couple of strokes. Okay, it's very, yeah. right? And it's, is it working? Yeah. Okay, so the beauty of this is the simplicity, right? We have 10 strokes and it's a bull and it's quite obviously a bull, um, you know, and that's what we're going for when we do these assessments because at the end of the day, we just want to know where our horse is at. So before we start, I just want to make sure we have the concept of tensegrity down because it's a big part of how we look at the horse. And, you know, a lot of people talk about fascia, which is awesome. And I'm so excited that more and more people are talking about it. But for me, I've kind of gravitated a lot more towards the tensegrity concept. And I think the biggest thing that you need to understand is that you know, we think of the skeleton as solid, but it's not, right? There are all these things that are floating in the fascia. And, you know, these concepts that we focus on sometimes in terms of what's connected to what and what's pulling on what, we have to think global, right? Tenses, tension version versus compression, hanging versus bracing, pushing together or coming apart. So the biggest concept to remember when we look at all these images and we go through all these structural assessments is bones push out and muscle and fascia compresses in. And if we remember that, it'll be easy for us to see where things might have lost the balance of tensegrity within the body. So um, the art of seeing the horse, what we're gonna look for is visual structural assessment, right? And we're looking for compensation within that visual structural assessment. And then we wanna look at global posture. Very often, you know, I get called out, the horse has a, is lame in the right hind. Well, everybody's looking at this right hind, but that's not the biggest issue. It, it is the biggest issue because the horse is lame on it right now, but it's not where it started. It started somewhere else. And very often that's silent. And so when we start to look at the horse in this three-dimensional pattern, and we look at weight distribution, we look at um, stance, we look at what they're doing, um, habitually, we can start to see that bigger pattern and connect related events because 
That's what leads to pathology and injury, the related events. So what if it was simple? We're only gonna be looking at bend, rotation and pull. And pull is gravity because we're all fighting gravity and pull of the tensegrity within the body. And as we go through this, I mean, we can make this as complex as we want and we can make it as simple as we want. But the way I've kind of seen how it works is once you start seeing even one thing in each category, it's really easy to build on that. So let's have a look at what it looks like. Bend. So bending is anything off the vertical line. Um, it's also called lateral flexion. And again, you know, most of us know what lateral flexion is, but it's much easier to say the horse is bent. <laughs> um, so this plane of motion is the most primitive, right? We all started in the water and we all came from aquatic uh, surrounding and that movement like the fish do from side to side, that is the most primitive motion. And when um, the body gets set in a pattern, it'll generally pick a side to bend to. So identifying the direction of the bend is really helpful in understanding what the horse can and can't do and where it has mobility and doesn't. And very often um, they're bent specifically to one side. Sometimes if a horse has had trauma or significant injury, they're gonna be outliers. So what you then need to do is go further back. So zoom out even more, really think about the simple general outline. So here's another way to look at Ben. This is one of my distance uh, structural therapy clients. and. <laughs> Um, the owner was very concerned with the asymmetry between left and right hind quarters, but all I could really see is that the sacrum was on one side and the head was on the other, and it's that simple. If you see that, your horse has bend, right? It's not difficult to kind of go, oh, <laughs> what happened there along the way? So it really is about looking at the great picture and understanding that if you have that, how do we go about helping the horse to be a little less curved? And here again, we have various degrees of bend. And if you look at the horse that has the, in the top hand um, left corner, the number one, he seems relatively straight. I mean, there's some spinal rotation there, but it seems relatively straight. So zoom out and you just kind of- Tammy, can you take your pointer to number one so that we're clear on that? Um, no, I can't because <laughs> I don't have a pointer. So if we okay, start on the left-hand side, it's the second horse from the left. Okay, so there's right? a green blob blocking out a next picture. So the next second. picture. Yep. Um, if you look at that, you know, it's hard. That horse seems relatively straight to the others, but is it really? If we zoom out and we look at the greater picture, can we see the bend of that horse? Yep. Right, and so. Again, it comes down to just identifying where the horse is comfortable being because fascia sets in the pattern in which we move. So if the horse is comfortable being that way, um, that is their natural position and space. And so that's something that we have to help them through um, you know, changing their motion and changing their habits, maybe change or make more flexible. Tammy, so, do you see in yes. horses without injury, um, yeah. although that's kind of a, a quasi statement, um, is there a percentage of the horses that you see are, that are more left versus the percentage that are more right, or is it? So this is the way that so far, and I'm working on this, and I have insurmountable evidence that's mounting. There really is only one pattern for horses. And when I have it all down and I have all my backups and everything um, to support all that, I will probably write something about that. But what I'm finding is that there really is only one pattern and the outliers are generally ones that have had um, severe trauma. Okay, fascinating. Okay, uh, so the next thing we're gonna look at is rotation. So I've become fascinated with the spiral, which is why I've moved a little away, I think, from fascia and more towards this tensegrity model, because I think everything in the body really is spiraled. Um, rotation happens along the horizontal line. 
uh, rotation again is one of those most fundamental movements because if you look at you know molecular development of the body, cellular development of the body, uh, embryonic development of the body, they all spiral. Um, and for me, the easiest way to always explain it to people is every spiral in the body works like a corkscrew. So if you think of those rotations of the corkscrew or the spring, that's what happens because the spine is always going to try and correct itself. So if we have, you know, a rotation to the left, at some point down the spine, there's going to be a rotation to the right. Um, I put in Freyette's laws, just um, there's three of them. If you guys are interested, you can look them up online. We're just going to look at the third one, which is uh, when motion is introduced in one plane, it will modify, could be reduce motion in the other two planes. So when we think of a horse that is bent and there's never bend without rotation and that's the other two laws pertain to that but if we think of a horse that is bent that bend or that rotation is going to reduce motion in all the other planes around so our bend is restricting our tensegrity in a sense i hope that makes sense let, let me see if i can understand this so it's saying that if we have a restriction in one plane of movement, it affects the other two planes of movement. Yes, exactly. Okay. So if our horse is bent or if our horse has any spinal rotation, um, all the planes of movement are going to be affected and restricted. So somebody's asking for a definition of planes. I, I think you have to go back, uh, if you will, to your cardinal left, right, up, down, um, and well, planes of motion would be, you know, I have it here, it's frontal plane as in side bending, sagittal plane as in flexion, extension, and transverse plane as in rotation. Oh, I think we're talking about the spelling. <laughs> oh. Planes, P-L-A-N-E-S versus oh, P-L-A-I-N-S. Yes. <laughs> Autocorrect. Okay. I can't spell to save my life. Okay. okay fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, and then I kind of, I put this in because I like how it shows, it'll start in a minute. I go, I'm sure you guys have a little bit of, there we go. Yeah, so if we start. box out the big structures in the body in a symmetric horse, and there we have our spinal rotation horse and we box that out as well, we can start to see those shifts and rotations. And then if we overlay them, we can start to understand how the horse might be struggling with things, right? And so- Can you play it again? Yes, let me play it again. Let me go back, play it again. I know it's a little fast. It's a okay. and it's and it's a bit of a delay on our end. Okay, so there we go. I'm playing it again. So this is our straight horse within the box. There is our spinal rotation horse. There are the markings for the spinal rotation horse. And then if we overlay them, we can start to see this shift. Right. Okay, so if we think about, it doesn't amount to much, but if we add all those shifts, this is what happens. This is why the spiral is my new thing. So, you know, you read, you expand your mind, you kind of go, oh, I so missed that. So when everything is aligned, um, where these spirals cross or where there is big uh, points of tension, um, they should be over bony columns. But when we have shifts, these points are no longer over bony columns or are no longer supported by the structure as intended. And so they create this road to pathology because everything has rotated off the center. Everything is no longer balanced in a way where the body was designed to take the stress. I and then we also sense. have to take into consideration the anomalies in structure. In other words, not every structure is built the way we think of in anatomy, that we all have this no. individual variation, which will innately put in some rotation or side bend or stress. Right. And so I have yet um, to find a straight horse. Right. I, I know that I'm sounds not awful. Find a straight person either, by the way. No. And yeah. that's the other thing I'm working with. Um, I posted a while ago uh, a video of this lady who put a guy in a fascial suit and gave him oh, a yeah. fascial restriction, uh, Sterling Structural Therapy. And so I work with her and we connected because she goes, oh my God, you see in horses what I see in people. Yeah. And we have long, long conversations about patterns and what people are doing and how horses are the same and so on. So yes, um, this hunt for symmetry 
is um, is a little futile. Um, plus, if you think, you know, the more I read about um, the development of the physiology of the body, of anybody, any mammal, um, you start to understand how it's almost impossible simply because of how we develop in terms of that spiral. Yep, so I have a question here. Someone's asking to what extent do the spirals that you're illustrating correspond to anatomy trains, which is uh, Tom Meyer's work, I believe, um, his spiral lines and functional lines. And I so I think he, he follows the, um, the fascial bags. So again, we have to think about the concept of that. Um, these are, I'm trying to figure out where the spiral is in the body. These spirals are what I find. So when I touch horses and on average, I touch, you know, five to six horses a day, this is what I find. But when he puts his spiral lines in, there are way more crisscross overs on the lateral line and on that spiral line on the rib cage. Um, but he follows pockets for muscles. I follow what happens to the body on a global level. So they're, I suppose, related, but they're not, you know, this isn't like the fascia lines, the way that he has portrayed them or the way that um, they appear in those fascia line article on the horse. And I'm working on mapping that out to see if there is a correlation. Um, and I'm sure there is, but we have to remember that it takes more, and this is where, it's really interesting that our concept of how the body works has evolved so much, mm -hmm. but how we test it is still very much late in coming forward. And, you know, we, we need to think of the ribs moving individually, but generally what happens is that the ribs move as a unit. Um, for a lot of the horses that I find, they are locked in very specific patterns that um, correlate to this more than they do to what I find in the fascial lines. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, uh, um, we had that little conversation about ribs prior to opening the webinar, and um, I, I'm sure that you'll talk more about ribs in this talk, but I think they're, um, they're so critical, and yet in many cases they can be overlooked in terms of their importance in setting structural right. patterns. So what happens very often is, um, okay, for the gentlemen, I'm sorry for the ladies, you know, horses, you know, we sit on them, right? And we sit on those ribs and then we put a tight girth on and it's like a tight, tight bra. And we all know that one of the first things ladies do when they get home is take their bra off, right? And for people, turns out there is a lot of restriction there as well. And so what I'm finding is that a lot of these horses in the first nine ribs have very little motion. Um, and that means they have no bend. And so because of their compensation patterns, a lot of these horses have a very locked barrel. And um, a locked barrel means the breathing is locked and so on. It's this kind of snowball effect and maybe we need to do a webinar about that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But I, I, we need to be clear that it's not that there's enormous movement in the ribs, There, there is some movement and it's, uh, and the amount of movement differs depending on the rib. Right, but we also need to remember, and you know, this is always true with horses, that the smaller the range of motion, the more important it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, it's one of those oxymorons of, you know, it's, it's a very tiny uh, motion, but it's super important to the entire balance. Yeah, no, All right, I, let's I, uh, move I on. I do have another question, yeah. which may or may not be appropriate right now, but I'll ask it. She says, do you find that there are types of girths that affect this less or more? And uh, I just want to interject that the, the sternal groove is going to influence the girth and how it fits in many, in, in a right. way. So right. I think it's- I don't know that, um, I don't know that there's any girth that does it more or less. I think what happens is, um, and this is, and I will get to that later in the talk, is when we create um, a habit in terms of physiology, right? So if there is constant pressure there from above, from the person sitting and from below, from the girth, and we're creating this kind of restriction there that doesn't allow for things to move properly, over time, the body will just forget. Right. This is what neuroplasticity does. Oh, I don't move there. Yeah. And so, 
they stop to do it regardless of whether it's painful or not. This is why, again, you know, we were talking about pain. Um, we know that there can be pain long after something has healed. And so this is my thought process when I try and go, can we look at a more global event connected structure as opposed to it just hurts here or it's just reactive here? Um, how do things interrelate to each other? I think that's really important in trying to help these horses move better and do better. Yeah. Okay, so um, it's when we look for rotation sometimes, and I learned this again through, you know, doing these kind of texting back and forth with clients, it's a little hard to decide what's rotating in which direction. <laughs> and so, um, it's also interesting because that comes down to interpretation of the person as I've learned that everybody interprets things differently and that's partially got to do with our brain and how we think and so on. So in order to make it simpler to see rotation, I started to do this sort of thing and I'm sure some of you have seen it on Facebook where we really box it out a little like Picasso's bull in the simplest of lines. So. We are looking for, you know, that central line down the spine and we try and box in those um, areas behind the scapula, which are always very telling about scapula orientation, um, which, you know, has huge implications beyond just where it sits and what it does to the saddle. And then we can see what the barrel is doing and we can see what the pelvis is doing. And that allows us to see where the rotation is happening. So where things in the contractile field are close together. So remember our tensegrity concept. So where the fascia and the muscle is pulling together or compressing in and where bones are pushing out, right? And so we start to look at it in a more global way that allows us to see things from a little pr different perspective. Very often people look at horses on a lateral view. They look at one view and the one view gives them information, but it only gives them information about that one view. When, you know, it's like anything, when you have a bird's eye view, you get more information. And so I think in order to get a really good concept of uh, bend or spinal rotation, a bird's eye view like these will give you a little bit more information. And so the last thing I want to look at, and don't worry, we're not done. We've got more stuff to go, but- Can I, I just have a question picture. about that last slide, okay? Yes, um, going back. Somebody's yes. asking, um, uh, let's see, do you actually put tape, like you, you have drawn the lines on these photos, but have you ever right. like actually placed tape on the horse and then taken a photograph that way? No, I have not. And, um, so I have severe tactile issues. And so to me, the thought of somebody putting tape over hair um, that's pulling on all those pylor erectors and on all that fascia and might not be very nice is not something that I have done or feel that the horse would um, appreciate. And so I find that the way that I, tell my clients to do it and I do it is I get the horse to find their comfortable zone. So I ask them to stand square, but then I let them arrange themselves how they want because by forcing a horse to be square, it's not giving us information because the, the patterns are stuck in the habitual movement, right? Habitual movement is the flip coin or the flip side of the coin of rest, right? Motion and rest are two sides of a different coin of the same coin. And so if we let the horse arrange itself how it would stand there without any human input, we're going to get the information we need. If we put it square, it's going to suck it up and do what it can to kind of comply. Um, and yes, you're going to get some information, but you're not really going to see what's happening in the body. So I find that drawing the lines makes it easier. Got it. Okay, let's go to pull. Um, pull is the result of unbalanced tensegrity and obviously fighting gravity. And so what we are looking for always is, you know, sagging, compression, excess tension, anything that tells us that 
things are working against each other, which is really what it comes down to with tensegrity. And if we look at Valiente here, and here we do our first little exercise, I want you guys to think about where is your eye taking you? Where is the most obvious place in the body that you're like, oh my God. Um, and then I'm going to show you where my eye goes, which is here. So the top of the circus tent. Um, and so when we talk about related events or um, how things are pulling in one direction, this is what I mean by it. So if you follow the body, if you follow those lines like Picasso did with his bull, where, is, where are all the roads leading you? Where is Rome? If you find Rome on the horse, you will most likely find what is holding that pattern. Okay, and the, the concept is, you know, I had to do one side, but when I see a horse or when I have lots of images is I look at the 360 and I try and see where are all those arrows pointing? Where is, what is holding up that whole pattern? Where is all the tension pulling towards? Does that make sense? Yeah, and I, I just love this image actually. And um, can you just go back to the one without the lines? Because I think it's important for people to, to look at that and then imagine the lines and then see the lines again. That, that, and I think the other thing that you're probably trying to tell us is it, it's okay if you make a mistake in terms of if you're looking at your own horse and drawing lines, you gotta get started somewhere. You have to start. Right. Messing with and this is why I said pick one thing. If you can identify the bend, if you can identify the rotation and one bone that's sticking out more than the others, well, hey, you're already ahead of the game. Right. Right. And so this really is about um, because once you see that, right, once you look at a horse like this, um, you start to go, oh, that explains. And his owner is a dressage rider and you know, I gave her her homework and we've had vast improvements in a week, but it really comes down to learning to see it. And once she saw it, you know, once I marked up the pictures for her, she was like, oh my God, that explains la 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 la, right? And so um, it changes how you think. And then that allows you to help the horse do what you would like it to do. It's that's Dr. Feldenkrais always said, you can't do what you want until you know what you do. Yes, I think very true. Funny. So true in this <laughs> picture, yeah. Because where, where do you, if you can't see it or feel it or, or recognize it, then it doesn't exist. Right, and so, you know, this horse, so it's interesting enough, this horse had a lot of tendon issues, right? In his front legs, they get very inflamed, but we can start to see why, because everything is pulling up to that hip, right? right? And, you know, once you start to release some of that pulls, once you try and balance that tensegrity out, well, you know what, a week later, and this is a lay person, this is not a physical therapist or a body worker, a lay person did the exercises given, and a week later, guess what? He does his, he does his uh, rehab rides, no inflammation in his uh, tendons, or very little. Okay, right. we, we have a we have a question here. Is someone's asking? Um, they pointing out that he's not standing square. So not standing square seems to be an indication of discomfort. I would say question mark. So for me, it's this is like I said before. If we ask the we ask the horse to stand as square as possible, but he couldn't possibly stand square with his hip rotated up and over. There's no way he could do it. Right, and so this concept that we have that a horse needs to stand square um, is great in theory, but if you have any kind of spinal rotation or any kind of asymmetry, um, you're not gonna stand square. And I invite all of you, after we're done, to go look in the mirror, put on some, you know, just put your t-shirt and your underwear on and really look at the negative space between your ear to your shoulder, between your hip to your rib cage, and tell me if when you think you're standing square, you're actually square, because I bet you you're not. <laughs> so, uh, no, I totally agree with you um, in that. But on the flip side, the converse side, if you see a horse standing more square than not square, is that an indication that he's, he's moving in a good direction? Yes, most definitely. So if we have a horse that, um, because the thing also is, and here is the catch. This is where I said you can learn this in layers. 
If you see a horse standing square, the next thing you're going to look at, you're going to go check. We're doing really well. I can put all four bony columns under my body. Woohoo, right? Awesome. Now the next thing to look at is, is anything paying the price for that? So a lot of times I see horses that comply for their owners and stand square and their lumbar does a kyposis or a lower dorsis. So I will put it in simpler terms it either sags in or bunches up or sways sideways in order to do that. Um, a lot of times they will shift their jaw in one location or slightly tilt their head in order to allow to do that. So that doesn't mean that's bad, but what it does mean is as an owner or a rider, you need to identify these spots and allow for work or therapy to release those spots. So when the horse gives you what you want, they don't start a pathological path in those areas. Does that make sense? Yep. And I'm just wondering, like, if we wanted to get sort of the quote unquote truest picture of our horse, it sounds like taking a picture of them out in a paddock somewhere where they're just on their own would be the really best place because yes. then you're free from interference. Yes. So I always tell people, observe your horse eat, observe how your horse rests. Cause like I said, rest and motion. Cause you have to assume if you have a horse that is resting for many hours in their stall, right? Where the fascia is like dormant. It's like a person that moves a lot and exercises and a person that sits. And we've all seen those images of what happens to fascia when you're in a sedentary lifestyle, right? So they stand in their stall in very distinct positions in very repetitive patterns for long hours. That tells you how your horse is. The way they stand there, because how crooked they are when they stand, when they move off, they start from that position of dysfunction, right? So we are reinforcing the pattern every time we move off. <laughs> so, and people are no different, right? It's not right. like, it's just horses. We do the same thing. And so the, the thing is to use that neuroplasticity is to try and help the horse learn a different way. But yes, if we want to, uh, assess how our horse is the simplest way is to observe them without our interference to observe their habits right some horses have habits like and people tell me that and they never correlate it further so every time i girth them up they you know they put their foot forward well maybe they're trying to relieve some pressure right maybe they're that means something right that right. means there is maybe something in the way or you know, people say to me, every time I get on the horse, they do like a weird wiggle. Well, that means something. So those patterns that are habitual, that happen on a regular basis, are the best way to understand what is happening in your horse. Yep, I, I couldn't agree more. And um, the one of the things that, you know, I've, I've heard is that if we actually were perfectly balanced 50-50, the problem is, what yeah. would we start with? That well, asymmetry, asymmetry is part of us. It's part of yes. humans and part of horses. And we want to be as, as middle as possible, but there is no such thing as perfect middle because in order for us to move forward, we have to weight shift to advance a foot. They have to weight yes. shift to advance a foot. So yes. I think what you're saying is that the, that there's a, uh, if you will, a healthy asymmetry, an asymmetry which is yes. allowing good function and an unhealthy asymmetry. And that's what we're always striving for. So when I um, help clients like this lovely dude, um, I'm not looking to make him a perfectly symmetrical horse. I'm looking to allow enough room in his fascial bag for him to comply with his owner and still remain soft and not develop tension patterns or pathology, right? So it's just like us when we go and get, you know, therapy and very often, uh, and again, you know, this is what I've learned from uh, Donna at uh, Sterling Structural Therapy is this, you know, little things can make a huge difference. And it's not that we're going to change the horse's uh, structure so much as we're going to increase its functionality. Right. And so if the horse is very curved or very bent and we start to bend it the other way or make more room for it, then um, it allows for the structures that are in the contractile field to do better and to keep functioning. 
Right. Um, we have a question that uh, someone, her horses stand square at the hay feeder, but both stand with their feet very close together. Does this indicate a particular pattern? Yes. So when you have, generally when feet are close together, that that is a restriction, right? So a horse would naturally, because the easiest way to stand is to have the weight distributed sort of evenly, right? And so when we have feet that are close together in the hind or in the front, there is some sort of restriction happening. And so uh, whenever you have feet like, um, I have a client has this lovely giant mare who seems very square, but when you watch her walk, she's walking a tightrope. Mm -hmm. Right. And a lot of times when feet are close together, that tells me there is some ventral line stuff happening. But, you know, obviously without seeing the entire picture, and this is where we're going back to this global assessment, that is just one piece of the information. It's not the entire piece. Right. Okay. And let's look a little bit more at this sort of concept of pull. Um, you know, I was trying to figure out how to explain that uh, to people I was working with. So if we look on the left hand, the two images of the horse's uh, croup before and after therapy. So before, if you look in the red line, you can see those abdominals. You can see that line of the abdominal muscles. We have that crinkling in the green line. We can see the blue arrow is shorter. So there's that contractile field between the ilium and the last rib. And then we can see a much sharper bend up top in the uh, croup. And after therapy, we can see there is less lines. There is a way bigger uh, contractile field or the, there's a bigger distance between the ribs and the ilium and we have a way softer croup. So this is pull. This is quite clearly tissue that's cranking itself together to hold things together, right? And so that restricts motion. And if we learn to identify that and we can allow for that to be freer, um, it's going to allow the horse better locomotion. Now we have to assume, and I'll go into that some more, when we achieve that, it doesn't last forever because the horse's pattern of motion um, might change a little with correct therapy and correct exercise, but the basic pattern is still going to be there. We're still going to get back to that. It might take longer, but, you know, this is what is meant by habitual pattern, how we are put together. So it's important to remember that, that, you know, we're, we're always shoveling snow while it's snowing. Is that a correct term? <laughs> you know, it's, it's a, it's a work in progress. It's never complete. I think maybe that's the better way to put it. Um, and then if we look at the right hand picture again, you know, I put in some arrows to kind of show you where, where is everything taking me? Where is everything in that horse? Where is it all sliding to? Where is it all converging to? And you can see in the red circle, she has a whole bunch of dimpling and she's actually had some scar tissue there, but we can see how everything pulls there. And in the green circle, can you see that divot yeah. Um, again, that is all tension. That is all things that are, you know, the rib is jutting out, right? So the bones are pushing out, but the fascia and the muscle is pulling in. So we, that tells us there is an issue there. There is an issue with a tensegrity within the structures that surround that. But in order to see where that's coming from, you need to look at the bigger picture. So again, that's kind of the concept of pull. And then I put in but this. Can we, this can we just go back for a second? Yes. Because, because this picture, the, the whole horse uh, brings up a point for me is the difference between posture and confirmation. And to me, when I look at this picture, I see both posture and confirmational issues that would cause right. tension lines. Yes. Um, and but the thing is, you know, at the end of the day, when we all go out to the barn, the horse we have is the horse we have. Correct. So we can we can argue posture and confirmation. And I think the concept with this structural assessment or this learning to look is to empower the horse owner to help the horse that they have. Right. And so, um, you know, this mare, yeah, she has a lot of issues. I would totally agree. And some of them are postural and some of them, you know, she could use some help with her feet. And there's a whole bunch of stuff going on. But at the end of the day, for the owner to understand why they're struggling with something, if they're able to have a look at that horse and go, okay, everything is pulling that way. What can I do to help it? Got you it. know, what can I do to change? Because 
that's the horse she has, right? She's not going to go and buy a new horse. No, no, and, and I'm, but I'm just, this picture so illustrates to me that there's some confirmation things and postural things and yes. causing all those tension lines that, that I guess what I'm trying to say is that that would open the door to have that conversation with the owner um, because they might not realize that there's both of those things going on. Well, I think that this is always where um, we have to have that conversation and I've had it frequently where we talk about um, where we'd like to go, uh, what we have, and what the realistic medium in between is. Mm -hmm. And you know, what can we and can't we change? Right. Okay, but I needed something that would be obvious enough for people to see what I mean by pull, which is why I chose this. Um, no, it's a great picture. illustration. It's a great illustration. It just led me down another path. <laughs> yes, and I, and I totally get it. And again, this is... Um, if we're talking about, you know, horse owner empowerment, uh, there is a concept of, um, and I think this is, I really have become more cognizant to that, of this is the horse we have right now. What can we do to support the horse we have right now? And what do we need to identify as, you know, pitfalls so that we can learn to walk around them? Yep. Because we work right. no matter what. <laughs> exactly right and the, the owner and this horse um both have a, an awesome attachment to each other and you know i don't think this horse would have done well or survived with anybody else so you know it's one of those things where you you kind of you help people help the ones that they love and work within that parameter and here's another example so um <laughs> This is great. I posted a, a while ago about, and this is always an interesting conundrum for me, you know, um, about whether this is weak abdominals or an overworked back. So a back that is so contracted and so overworked that um, the horse is sagging. And again, we're looking at, you know, where are all the lines taking us? And, you know, this isn't a hard one to see. But um, I did want to make the point with a lot of people that think that um, this is because the horse has weak abdominals. And so there is maybe an element of that, but to me, these things are almost always related to the fact that the back is so contracted and so dead that um, this is how the horse is. And so, you know, if we think about abdominal muscles and how big they are in relation to the apaxial muscles, we need to really consider what we consider um, core muscles or what is holding that back up. Um, and so I think whenever I see these and people are like, oh, I need to work on the abdominals and I need to engage, all I'm going to say here is um, you need to examine your thoracolumbar fascia because that's really responsible for keeping that internal pressure within the thorax. And if it's become dead, because we've put bad saddles, heavy rider, whatever on it, um, and it's no longer functional, you're gonna have that as a result. Um, I'm also gonna say that abdominals hang off the pelvis and so, and a little bit off the lumbar. And so if we think about the fact that, you know, very often, and for almost every body worker I know, when we come out and treat the horse, the back will come up. Well, we didn't fix the abdominals in 60 minutes, right? Right. So um, when that back comes up, it's because we've released that contractile field that's pulling that pelvis and that scapula together. Right. And so I challenge you to think a little outside the box. And sometimes it can be very counterintuitive. I'm just as guilty of it. But I challenge you to think a little bit beyond um, what seems to be obvious. Be because the body is a weird and wonderful thing. And very often what is obvious is not necessarily what's going on. So um, last thing I wanted to talk about is um, our homunculus or how our brain perceives our body. So very often, and we touched on this a little bit, um, it's not just restriction. And um, I encourage you to check out uh, Thomas Hanna and his book, Somatics. I put a list in the back of all the books. Um, he kind of calls this sensory amnesia. So habitual movement patterns, repetitive motion, uh, long-term injury, all change the concept of the brain 
um, of where our body is in space and what is upright and what is functional and what is not. This is what neuroplasticity is, right? And so a lot of times, um, as I said, they stand in the same way, they move off in the same way, they have, you know, we train them to do, we want to get whatever movement we want to get and we train in a specific way. And so they learn to work a certain way. The body, the brain learns, okay, this is how I need to do this. And it becomes lazy to an extent. And so their concept of balance, their concept of motion is altered. And so if we look at what uh, Thomas Hanna said, it is a memory loss of how certain muscle groups feel and how to control them. And because it occurs in our central nervous system, we are not aware of it, yet it affects us on our very core. And so I think a lot of times I meet horses and this goes back to when I said, you know, pain and reactivity and range of motion, we use those as an indicator and they are valuable, but they have limitations because a lot of times we can have pain after there is no more injury. We can have loss of range of motion not because the joint isn't functional or you know what the muscles aren't functional but because we haven't used it in so long or the horse hasn't used it in so long that they no longer have cognitive awareness of it and so that changes how they use their body and they keep feeding that infinite loop of dysfunction in a certain way and so in order to break that we need to help them and unlike humans horses change very quickly we need yeah. to help them be a little more aware of where their body is in space um, and how they are moving and remind the brain that hey remember when you used to be able to turn here <laughs> so it's not always just restriction and it's really important to remember that that there is that concept involved um well and, and somebody's just asked the question she's wondering if that's why surefoot pads have such an impact and yes yes absolutely um, and I was talking to Wendy before we started. I've been playing with the uh, pads because I called Wendy one night and I'm like, hey, have you done blah, 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 blah. And Wendy's like, uh, yeah. <laughs> and so <laughs> off I went and I played with all these things and they really help because what happens is it changes that, um, it changes that information that travels from the foot up to the brain. Um, and then it changes that neuroplasticity. It reminds them like, wait, Whoa. And when we have, the thing is, the key with all these things is just like for people, if you want to change your habit, you need to have daily input and small, soft daily input in order to do that. You can't change it overnight. You can't decide tomorrow my shoulder is not going to be lower. My left, right shoulder isn't going to be lower than my left. You can't. You need to work on it. <laughs> and so um, here is a little example of it. This fella is a jumper and the first picture on the left um, that's how I met him and his neck was literally like two zip codes over and <laughs> and then after the first session he's better and I came back two weeks later and his neck's not up but yeah it was migrating back there and the scapulas were shifting and we can see the rotation come back in right and so then we treated him again and he was better than the first time that we treated him so he was much more symmetrical but we can start to see that he has a real issue in that right scapula, because no matter what we're doing, that scapula has a, if you want, lack of blending in with the rest of the body. And so that gives us an indication like, okay, we have a thing there that we need to take care of um, so that the horse can keep doing what we want it to do. And so this is part of, and this horse had no awareness, like he does great. They didn't call me out because the horse wasn't jumping. He was doing exactly what he needed to do, but he forgot that he could have his neck be aligned with his spine. <laughs> yeah. um, so we, and, we have a question. Um, do yes. you feel teaching the horse new and very different things helps them forget patterns as they make new ones? Um, and I, I can, I have my opinion on that, but I'll let you uh, answer that. First. So it depends what you mean by new and different things. When I work with them, I'm not teaching them new and different things. I'm reminding them in a very soft, slow way, how they can move or where we would like to have more motion. I'm not teaching them anything. They forgot, or they have 
disassociated themselves from certain parts in their body or they were so restricted for so long they just go oh that doesn't move and very often you know people that do body work will tell you see it right you work on the horse and then all of a sudden they reach around and they're like hey wait i can do this so i don't feel like i'm teaching them anything i'm reminding them i think that is the way i look at it yeah and and I find, especially with Surefoot, I think of it as restorative. We're restoring them to the patterns that they had prior to whatever yes. happened. Yeah. Um, okay, so it's the same concept. Yes, I'm not. Yeah. I'm not telling them. Look, you can do this now. They could do it before, but somewhere along the lines that was lost. Right. And so what you know, what I what I try and do with how I help clients help their horses is to remind the horse that it's um more comfortable to be here as and, opposed to there <laughs> right and they're designed to seek ease the thing is you yes. can seek something that's why horses forgotten. change way faster than people right? right people are like yeah you have to remind them you have to keep reminding them horses don't like they choose the path of least resistance and yep. so when you remind a horse like Hey, do you remember how comfortable it feels to be here? Like when you had space between your mandible and atlas and they go, whoa, you can see it happening. And then a lot of times these horses that are bent one way, by the time we're done, they're bending the other way because they're like, this is kind of nice. It doesn't last because, you know, their life goes back to the way it is. But if we keep at it, it will eventually change. Right. Um, and so somebody's asking, so uh, new straight in credit and parentheses straighter habitual patterns can be developed yes so i wouldn't call it straighter i call it more balanced right, right. so we are restoring some sort of pattern that allows for the body to cope with the stresses that it's subjected to that's the way i look at it i'm not making a straight horse i am restoring balance tensegrity so that the horse can cope within the parameters of its body with what it's being asked to do. Cause there's no reason why it shouldn't. I mean, we're all kinds of lame and broken sometimes and we still go out and run and do stuff and function. And so the horses are no different, but we get help for us. And very often we um, wait until the horse is broken before we think, oh, wow, maybe there's an issue because they are so quiet and because they are, allow for this to happen. The whole point here is to teach people to see the beginning of the pattern before we have an issue. Like that jumper that I showed you, he would have broken down eventually. You can't jump when your neck is two zip codes away. Right. Right. But that's kind of the thing. So as I said, it's simple. You have to find the bend, you have to find the rotation and you have to find the pull. So which bone is sticking out more than others? Where is the tissue compressing in and doing weird stuff? And what is gravity doing to the grand scheme of things? Um, and then I did this and that'll be fun for you, Wendy, because you're oh, going to wow. like be like, oh, so it's just a small one. I have hundreds of these and I will tell you that um, when I'm ready, I will come out with it. But um, it's very interesting and humans and horses are alike and we basically have two crooked beings communicating through a relatively immobile surface trying to go straight. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, it's true. It's absolutely true. And hopefully that immobile surface is straight, but that's a question too. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And so um, here is a list of the books I read this year um, that kind of changed a lot. And I didn't add uh, the one I gave you, Wendy, which is uh, Muscles and Meridians by Philip Beach. And so these books really helped me kind of get beyond where I was. And I'm going to unshare my screen so you can see yeah. me. Wait, um, where am I? Wait, where'd oh, no. it go? Wait, 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 wait. Stop. Oh, there you Here go. Comes. Wait. Back. Almost. <laughs> no, where am I? Oh, there you go. Here I am. Yeah. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> so um, this is the book. Let me hold it up so people can see it. Okay. Awesome book. Um, these books really helped me to change my concept. And um, I put Blink in there. Oh, Blink's a fabulous book. It's a anything because, by Bill Gladwell. Yes. So I will tell you, trust what you see. This is exactly the point. When you look at your horse, right, you have to trust what you see because your first will tell you like, oh, 
that looks weird. Yeah, it is weird. When you think that looks weird, it is weird. Trust that. Even if everybody else goes, oh, it's perfectly normal. Trust it, right? And so I think it really becomes down to um, working with what you have, uh, helping your horse have more balance, um, and trusting what you see and what you feel so that you can take all that information and help and grant you you need a, you know you need a good farrier and you need a good dentist and you need a good vet and you need to have tools but really there is a lot of information that's in front of you all the time if you can gather it um, and use it you can help before the horse falls apart is there somewhere that you have that list of books posted that someone can find it again? no i put a slide up at the end but i'll so Blink, take a screenshot, people. <laughs> okay. Uh, the challenge of pain. I already posted all of these, but, and then we have, I put them all out. Somatics by Thomas Hanna. And then we have that one, which was, I'll put it up again so you can see it. Okay. Those are all, um, you're going to read them and be like, oh, wow, it doesn't need to be so complicated. And that's what I meant by um, we've evolved so much. We talk about fascia. We understand it's all connected. Yet when we assess horses, we still assess them very much in terms of point A to point B, point B to point C. Um, and I think we need to get a little outside of that so we can see what caused what we are seeing. So. You know, I think that's the more I do this, the more I realize that whenever things go wrong, that's the result because nobody looked at this global pattern of connected events. And the hope with this is that um, owners will have the ability to connect the events before you have breakdown. And I, what I really appreciate is the simplicity of three things, right? Bend pull and rotation. And, um, you know, this is something I think anybody can do is take those pictures of their horse front, back side, both sides, and then just start drawing the lines. And, you know, so many people get stuck with, I have to do it perfect. You do not have to do it perfect. You just have to do it. <laughs> so when I um, work with people to teach them how to look, and we've done some experiments uh, with humans, not horses, um, I always tell them, you know, there's there's a really good trick because our brain gets in our own way yeah. and our eyes interpret the hand eye coordination is way ahead of what you think is happening. And so one of the ways to um, really diffuse all that and we get we get taught that in art school right at the beginning is you take your non dominant hand and you draw in one continuous line without looking at the paper whatever you're drawing. And what's really interesting with that is it takes away, we're focusing so much because we're using our non-dominant hand that there's a whole different neural pathway. And what's really interesting is the shapes that come out of that are way more true to what is really in front of you than if you drew with your dominant hand. Yeah. There's, there are some fantastic books about drawing from the right side of your brain and yeah. other things to help us get there. So we've had a couple of questions about, um, and I think that uh, probably to answer this in a broad way, what, what are some of the techniques that you use in your body work to help these horses? So I do a lot of these very soft um, somatic releases where I ask for bend and flexion in the correct way with the bones being aligned and I try to remind the horse of ranges of motion. Um, a lot of it is very soft bending. Uh, the key to them is to bend in the right place with the correct amount of ask when the horse is soft in the right direction. <laughs> so, so, you know, like so many things when it comes to teaching technique, that's not something you can teach over Zoom. Um, it's really something that is, yeah. Well, it does. You know what? I, I don't know about that because I've had to convey this to the owners through the structural assessment. And so far we've, I've had really good success um but i mean that's a one-on-one -on -one session that yes it's not, totally one-on-one -on -one and it's catered for that horse and where that horse needs to bend and what that horse needs to do yes yeah because i mean i don't what i find is that anybody who's really good at what they do it's because of the education and training that they've had 
that we all have to go through our own process to learn those skills and development and feel and experience. Um, and what right. um, I know that you've worked with a lot of different people. You are unique, I think. Um, <laughs> it's one way of putting it. <laughs> um, so, but we really appreciate what you've uh, given us today because I, I just love the simplicity. I love the illustrations that you've had. And I'm fascinated by the data that you're collecting because I can't wait to hear what <laughs> comes from that. Okay. Yeah. You know, it really is, I think that is my goal here is really to make it simple. It doesn't need to be complicated. We can help our horses. Um, we can see things that are simple and we can, change things for them for the better as a result. Yep. Yeah, it's great. Well, Tammy, I want to thank you so much for joining me today. It's, thank it's you for so having me. Have you? I wish we'd had you in the little screen on the side, but I understand. <laughs> <laughs> I'm technically challenged. Next time I'll do better. Okay, no worries. That you, this is way improved over the first time in terms of getting going with the technology. So it's just fantastic to see your growth and development in that area as well. <laughs> All right, and then um, just to remind everybody, um, Dr. Harmon is being moved from this coming Wednesday to the next week due to a conflict she has in her schedule. So our next webinar will be uh, Dr. Bowker on Thursday at three o'clock and it'll be his fourth installment. So. Um, I put up a link to the playlist that we have of his other webinars, and also you can go to Wendy's Winnie's on podcast and listen to the audio so that you're up to speed when we get to Bob on, on Thursday. Um, thank you all so much for joining me. Thank you again, Tammy. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Have a great Bye. day. Bye.